and welcome to episode 5 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 6th of March 2017. I'm Joe, and with me are Phelim. Hey, how's it going? And Ike. How are you? And Noah Jesse, because he is currently in the pub Après Ski, somewhere in the south of France. So we're a three-man team again, three-man show. But you are back, Ike. You're feeling better, presumably. Yeah, I'm alive this time. Yeah, that's good to hear. And you've been buying all sorts of stuff, including 4K monitors, but... Uh, <laughs> Have you managed to get that running at 4K yet? So... <laughs> you can just say no. <laughs> no. Well, I did once, but I only had HDMI, and it wasn't nice. <laughs> so it was 4K at 30 frames a second. Yeah, it was really, really horrible. <laughs> uh, well, you're the only one of us who can afford 4K, I think, unless you can fail in. No, I have two staple together. Uh, standard hd monitor so that's that's yeah me. well i'm on 720p laptop so yeah <laughs> but yeah i'd be very interested when you do get it working to see how the various desktop environments and, and distros work with 4k because the uh, high dpi stuff i hear it's a bit of a nightmare size 30 font all around yeah that's all you got to do is make really really big fonts yeah. or use a magnifier yeah, I hear Unity's not too bad, but then I hear conflicting reports about that. So I, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about that. So uh, I suppose we should get on with the news then. And uh, Steam VR is coming to Linux um, and Steam OS as well. Although it's only in beta at the moment, which beta is kind of a uh, air quotes beta because it's apparently a bit alpha quality, according to an Ars Technica review that I read. But still, virtual reality on Linux, this has got to be good. Virtual reality is awesome. That, that, that's all there is to it <laughs> i tried it once it's fantastic i've never actually tried it my wife uh her brother's got the htc vive which is what this is going to work with and she said that was amazing obviously that was in windows but everyone talks about how virtual reality is the future but for me i don't know it is it just sort of all i can picture is like the um money for nothing video in the 80s that really terrible <laughs> shitty um <laughs> virtual reality i don't know i mean is there well, any feature in it even with graphics that poor you'd be surprised how realistic it can feel for motion um i as a bit of a, a, a knickknack sort of christmas present um got a google cardboard for uh steph and for my brother and even with the sort of hokey sort of demo games and demo kind of i don't it's not a video but it's like a like the roller coaster thing yeah you'd be surprised you sit in a, an office chair and watch that and you'd be like oh you'd be like falling out the damn thing it's uh only got better like it's amazing i've seen some really sort of high-end stuff and there's also the japanese horror thing as well that they had um it was a bit like a a ring like horror movie thing it was brilliant atmospheric fantastic and when you've got the the new stuff and the graphics that you see in some of them, it's just amazing, like, um, fantastic. I, I'm all for it. I just can't justify spending the money on it. And also there's the issue that you need proprietary drivers. I mean, presumably even with um, the cardboard thing, you needed some sort of proprietary software. You, I can't imagine you had it on your phone with just F-Droid. I did not, no. I, that's why I bought it for them, so I could use it on their <laughs> phone. <laughs> yeah. Now, I know, Ike, you don't give a shit. You, proprietary drivers to the max um, <laughs> in Solus and that. But, I mean, yeah. the thing is that does it really matter? Like, if people are going to use proprietary drivers and stuff to play games and virtual reality stuff does it really matter that there's proprietary stuff involved as long as it's bringing them over to linux and making them use at least some open source free software um cool that's a bit of a mixed bag that one isn't that? um i mean you know if i was going to go the puritan route it'd be like well you know this isn't good enough you know but yeah i mean at the end of the day people are going to be appealing you know, they're going to want to come over and say, oh, there's this stuff on Linux we can now try out. So, I mean, the the pragmatic angle, yeah. <laughs> a lot of things with games, though, is most games, unless it's something like a simulator, which you're going to play for years, they're fairly fleeting. Like, you're not going to be sort of playing the latest platform game and then want to play that continually forever and then care that you can get source code because you're not going to hack levels yourself because then there's no surprise there. You've already done it yourself. So if they can at least get the hardware over and maybe push them in the direction of opening it. I mean, Nouveau drivers for NVIDIA are decent-ish these days. <laughs> ah, shut up. They are. No, they're fine, right? But consider where they used to be. Yeah, I'm using them on my desktop machine. I don't play any games or whatever, but for basic 2D stuff and watching videos, they work absolutely perfectly. Yeah. So I'm going to have to politely disagree with that. 
Um, I'm in a bit of a bad mood with Nova at the moment um, for the last couple of four years. Um, so it's just some of the stuff that they do really, really torments me. So one of the bugs I've been having to deal with lately is does not work on a 970. Cannot boot up any system with a 970. And it's just not just my system, by the way. This is across all Linux systems. Well, and this is with the open source Nouveau driver. Yeah. Stop you, having a fancy kit then. I'm fine. It's and not I'm fancy. That's the yeah. thing. It, it's <laughs> not fancy. It's the older Maxwell. It's not even the newer stuff. And it hasn't worked for like a couple of years now. And the newer stuff works. Like the new Pascal architecture, that's working. It's just this one card. But I mean, that aside, the, the fact that like loads of people have it and can't use it, Nova is okay for like you say for the basic stuff um it does have some problems like it's it's the the 2d part of it there's an xr is just not maintained at all um so that's kind of sad you have gpus that just don't work at all and that's the older generations hang on nova don't you mean nouveau i'm not french <laughs> you're supposed to be God. european man come on no 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 i i was born before that right it, it, Ireland wasn't European. <laughs> we had different mammies and daddies then. <laughs> Fair Wait a minute. I'm older than you, and I'm pretty sure we were in yeah, EU not by then. Not properly. Like, we wasn't going <sighs> into the song contests or anything. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get into late night politics, um, so you're basically saying that the open source drivers are shit. But the, Pretty much. as far as I understand it, the proprietary ones are reasonably good. And you've even got Optimus working, haven't you, now? Yeah, the Optimus story is getting better, but if you've got a laptop, you basically have a couple of options at the moment. If you want the maximum performance out of it, then you're going to have to run just the onboard, uh, just the NVIDIA itself and disable your onboard Intel graphics. That itself is going to eat your power completely. So you lose the, the your portability. Uh, you can't go anywhere with that laptop at all. Now, you can use one of the, the other solutions like Bumblebee, but at a significant cost like 20 to 30 frames per second worse. Um, so that kind of risk sucks. So in terms of Nova, it Nova, 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 however, it's Nuvo, not, it's not Nuvu, <laughs> yeah, Nuvu, yeah, okay. Nuvu <laughs> or no view in some cases, <laughs> um, then, it, I mean, it's considerably worse because the 3D performance is very bad. It's not thread safe. Um, even starting something like simple as Minecraft, to be fair, it's Java. It kind of sucks. Um, will on most systems just completely crash. Like you won't even be able to start it up, and it's it's kind of one of the the last remnants of the old bad Linux where you used to tell people, well, if you just boot up with no mode set, like to a new user, that's nowhere near friendly in the slightest. It's like what's a kernel parameter? So yeah, Nova, Nuvu, Novu, Nuvu. I don't like. Fair enough. All right, well, let's move on and talk about the Raspberry Pi Zero W. So the Raspberry Pi Zero came out, I think, just over a year ago, and that was the cheapest Raspberry Pi you could get. It was $5, um, but it needed all sorts of connectors to make it actually work. And now they've brought out the Zero W, which W stands for wireless, which means it's got Bluetooth, and they call it wireless LAN because it's not Wi-Fi certified, I think. I don't know, but basically Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And but they've doubled the price to ten dollars plus tax, um, which works out at um, basically about twelve quid now. I think in the UK, which is not too bad for a little Raspberry Pi entry level. You still need some dongles and stuff, but if you embed it in a project, then you can um, not necessarily have as many dongles and stuff. So I know Phelan, you have got a couple of Raspberry Pis at least. Any? Um, I don't know. Are you going to buy this one? Well, it is interesting. The only problem I have was I have a couple for cameras, uh, security cameras, because I had a break into the car. And I found that even those tiny little cheap sort of nano ones that you can get, the signal on them is just so poor that you end up. I end up having to get a one with a large uh, aerial attached to it. So I'd be interested to see how well that thing can, can receive stuff. Oh, what, in terms of wireless performance? Yeah. Because it's got this fancy um, aerial that they've um, licensed from a company. I can't remember where the company's from, but it's sort of cut out into the PCB yeah. sort of triangle thing. So, yeah, I'd be interested to see how well that works because 
I've only ever used the Raspberry Pi 3, which has got Bluetooth and wireless, um, just in my flat a few meters away from the router and never had a problem at all. But yeah, yeah if you're talking about serious range, then... Well, this wasn't I mean, even serious range. It was just because there's just a few walls just at the wrong angles or whatever. I don't know. Uh, Not being it. a wireless engineer, I have no clue what would be the better way of doing it. But but at that kind of price, it's worth just buying it just to see, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. If I was to get one, which apparently is impossible, and they're probably all gone anyway, uh, mainly why I didn't even get one of the Zeros because it's just so hard to get. Well, that was what I was going to get onto, actually, the availability of it. The Zero had basically zero availability. And also, the, the rumor is, the reason they called it the Raspberry Pi Zero is because they make zero profit on it. Selling it at $5 <laughs> is almost a lost leader to them. Whereas adding Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, they've now doubled the price, which seems like a more reasonable price, really, in terms of they can actually make a few pennies profit on it. Um which means that they're probably more keen to make more of them. Because think about yeah. it, if you're running a business, uh, you have to stop your production line of profitable Raspberry Pi 2s and 3s uh, and, and compute modules to make this zero, which makes you zero profit. Why? There's no motivation there, whereas now there potentially is the motivation. And although it's still one per customer, uh, I looked at a couple of the websites in the UK. Uh, one of them was out of stock, but two had it. So you could get one delivered in a couple of days. Okay. Even now, after it's been out for a few days now. You want it to be sustainable for them. You want them to be able to keep going with it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I would love to know, how, what, where does it compare processor-wise to all the different versions? This is where I usually end up getting lost and most of the time don't care because what I'm doing with them is never massively taxing to CPU-wise. But Well, the Zero, my understanding is that it's basically – on a par with the first generation ones, but slightly, uh, I think it's clocked slightly higher than the other ones, but it's a similar type processor. It's the um, ARM V7, so it's not 64-bit capable, even yeah. though obviously the Raspbian isn't 64-bit. But anyway, so it's it's fairly modest. So it's about as powerful, maybe a little bit more powerful than the original Pi, but it's smaller, cheaper, and it's got the wireless connectivity on it. Yeah, for what I'm doing with my sort of iot ones should i dare raise its name uh, <laughs> yeah that, that's fine because i'm actually using the first gen for a couple of things and i have one second gen uh, version one doing a few things so yeah well yeah. this is going to use less power than the, the yeah. first ones and it does so have a camera module so it'd be perfect yeah yeah it's got that connector on it yeah so yeah it's interesting though that they eben upton the um the boss man i suppose you'd say of the Raspberry Pi foundation and project he said that this is pretty much it for a while he reckons in terms of new hardware and now they're going to really knuckle down and concentrate on the software which um i'm hoping <laughs> is true i'm hoping they're is, going to it, hire does that someone. mean they're really going to make sure windows runs really well on it yeah mm, yeah but i mean i'm hoping that they can finally get someone with some serious linux experience to sort out the security issues in raspbian yeah, it's it's a bit ropey the way it's done. Right. They need to drop Raspbian, and they need to get someone in who actually really one cares about the Raspberry Pi. And I'm again, I'm trying to sound polite when I say this, but who knows what the fuck they're doing? <laughs> Do you mean a certain friend of yours who might uh, Wimpy. make it? Look, yeah. Well, I was well, going to yeah. suggest with it, but then you said, "Who knows what he's doing?" So yeah. I'm confused now. <laughs> <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> No, but I mean, Wimpy is someone who really cares about this. Ubuntu Mate is something that works on the Raspberry Pi. And then every so often, it's kind of like having that deluded friend who sometimes walks out the shop saying, I've got sweets. That's kind of Raspberry Pi with software. Because they just come out of nowhere. It's like, we've got a desktop now. Yeah, Why? I mean, the fact that they said that Pixel was their best guess at what people want as a desktop environment. I God mean, help us. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love LXDE. I really, really like it, but not for my main machine. Come on. I mean, even mm. I think that LXD is a bit lightweight and a bit bare bones. I prefer XFCE, but, you know, compared to what people are actually used to, be it KDE Plasma, Unity, Mate, you know, any of them, it's it really is your go-to for low-end hardware. Mm. And why they think that a sort of late 90s skin on LXD is what people want, is totally beyond me. And yeah, I would totally advocate that they hired Wimpy, to be honest, yeah. because he know he knows what he's doing. And they do have a relationship. 
I mean, when I went up there back in the days when I was doing the um, the Pi podcast, and I got given a Raspberry Pi three a couple of days before it was released, um, I said to them, "You should send WinPress one because he can, um, you know, he's he's doing this uh, Ubuntu Mate thing for it." And they were like, "Oh yeah, maybe we should." And sure enough, they did. And then he had a, mm. a weekend, a very stressful weekend, trying to sort it out before they released it. Um, but yeah, they should just hire him, and because you know Simon Long, the fellow who they've got at the moment, mm. w- with all due respect to him, he admits that he had never used Linux before they hired him. He never even used Linux. Never mind developed for it. And you know, it just it seems bizarre to me. But um, yeah, and then on the other side of the fence, we've got you know we've got Wimpy. He's like actually has a distro you know he's done this kind of stuff before he used to be a trusted user over the arts linux he's a core part of the mate project he's already building images for the device yeah but no let's just fork a dead desktop yeah well they haven't even officially forked it have they i mean that's my prediction that they're gonna fork Uh, it but you know should be all using raspberry and light anyway down with these gooeys yeah headless all the way well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, on this new Zero W, you, you're going to struggle to run a GUI on it. And even on the Raspberry Pi 3, I mean, I've got Ubuntu Mate on it, and I've tried Raspberry on as well. And the bottom line is it is just painful to use a GUI, really. Uh, anything beyond a bit of text editing, which you can do over um, SSH with Nano anyway, what what are you – the fact they've got LibreOffice on there, good luck, basically. <laughs> I mean, not not even Abbey Word or something lightweight, like full-blown LibreOffice, which really struggles on there, and Chromium as well. I mean, it works reasonably well, but it's still painful. So I don't know. Anyway, well, good luck to them. And that, they're going to sell a shitload of these is the bottom line because, you know, it's a cheap computer. Why not? For something with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi for, you know, 12 quid delivered, it's just a no-brainer really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah people won't care what's on it because it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. But um, kind of staying on the uh, Raspberry Pi theme, then RetroPie, they need some legal help. So RetroPie, as people probably know, is a, a distro for the Raspberry Pi, which has got all sorts of emulators baked into it um, and lets you play retro games, hence the name. Um, but that name has been trademarked in the USA by a third party, according to RetroPie. And they are getting all sorts of takedown requests for people over there trying to sell things compatible with RetroPie and even selling stuff, um, you know, pies and stuff with it on. And it's just a complete piss take, basically, and it's just an abuse of the trademark system. And so they need some legal help. Apparently, they've had all sorts of offers and they seem to possibly have it in hand, but I still can't um, hurt to mention it. If you know anything about trademark law in the US, then do help them out. Um, retropie.org.uk if you have a look there um, it's no good people trying to shake them down like this I mean they're, it, they're just some guys making a cool project why would you want to fuck with them because they can the system allows them to yeah basically I suppose and I mean from what I've I mean obviously you know I am not a lawyer <laughs> you know I ain't all that's my favourite acronym in the world <laughs> I ain't all right <laughs> <laughs> Only on Saturdays, but I ain't. <laughs> um, moving on very quickly. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically, they never trademarked it themselves. And while they do have the whole thing of prior art, in, and I'm guessing it's in Europe, but not the US, it's still technically legal. So you reckon they're fucked then? Completely and unequivocally bollocks. Shit. Yeah. Yeah, so cyber squatting is so last century, so it's a uh, trademark sabotage, I guess. Mm. Mm. Which is also what Terminix are facing. Now, I must admit, and I hope I'm not alone here, I had not heard of Terminix, but I can guess that it is a terminal emulator, much like XFCE terminal that I use. It's a terminal emulator, but it's so much more. And um, If I was to sell it, I, I don't use it personally, but, you know... Uh, Sometimes I speak to the guy who makes it, he's very passionate about it, and he's trying to make something that compete with what the, the cool developers on Mac might download. So it has, you know, like a, you have tiling, you have previews, you have tabs, uh, you have all these magical syntax highlighting things, and it knows about context and scripting. It's, you know, it's the Swiss Army knife of terminals, basically. Can I make it have a black background with green text? 
I think you can. <laughs> that's, all I, that's all I look for in a terminal. Yeah, as long as you can go retro and perhaps animate a couple of characters dropping down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> see Matrix, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's definitely got a bit of a cult following there. But they are going to have to change their name because of a trademark um, infringement, they call it. Mm. What can they do in open source? Because we'll start out these projects, you know, with pure intentions and then it gets a bit popular and it gets a bit known. And then someone comes along and it's like, all right, you've had enough fun, dickhead. Time for change. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> and you can't fight it because you're just a small project. Yeah, I hear they're going to change their name to Ordnance Survey. <laughs> <laughs> so while I'm here and I have no intentions of ever visiting the United Kingdom in the near future anyway, um, we'll get I'd back just to like that. to extend my thanks you know, to the Ordnance Survey for the lousy gobshites they are for going after my project for a name as well. Very similar to this. But my one is because it used the letters OS. Yeah, Evolve so, OS. Yes. Yeah, Evolve OS. You thought, okay, someone's going to be telling me about the name Evolve. No, OS, because of map. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not bitter about this at all, you know, but it wouldn't piss on them if they were on fire. So... I can understand this guy's pain. <laughs> I really can understand it. Yeah. Well, it looks like it's going to be changed to Mosaic, which is a fairly... Can't do that. Why not? Mosaic? What? They did not, really? Can't change it to Mosaic. That was another web browser. That's also oh dear. something to do with cryptography as well. There's a trademark for that, because I remember seeing that before. So they're probably just going to have to mash the keys and uh, come up with just... <laughs> Basically... This is just going to turn into a whole bike shed and I, I exercise. Um, this is exactly the same sort of thing as we had in Solus when it was a Volvo S. And, you know, I put up the Google Plus post and it's like, what should we name it? And there was at least three suggestions that were in Klingon. <laughs> Christ. Just don't ask people. And in the end, I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to call it Solus. I'm just going to reuse an old name. Just go for something uh, really unoriginal. That's Yeah, so this is probably going to end up being tiling terminal emulator for your Linux boxing or something. <laughs> uh, maybe they'll come up with a cool backronym for it. Mm. So, well, the doom and gloom continues and Manjaro Arm is shutting down, speaking of Raspberry Pis, because no fuckers using it, basically, is the bottom line. And they can't justify the development time, which uh, is a shame, really, because Manjaro, I, I, I love Manjaro. If I want to run Arch... I can't be bothered to run proper Arch. Manjaro is good enough. It's close enough. It's got a lovely XFC desktop. Everything, all the defaults are fine. And so it just gives me Arch light. I don't care. It's good enough. And now you're not going to be able to run it on ARM, unfortunately. It's sad to see a distro go. Um, there's an awful lot of effort, obviously, they put into doing it. But yeah, I mean, I imagine I, like everybody else, just didn't have a need for it, which is a shame. Yeah. I mean, I've never really properly used it on a Raspberry Pi, which is where I would use the ARM version of it. And the standard Manjaro is obviously going to continue, so it's not a great loss, but it's it seems that ARM is the future. I mean, Ike, I've joked with you about supporting other um, architectures and how ARM would be a good one, but then you said there's no such thing as ARM. You've got a million different versions of it. Yeah, and that's kind of the problem. So it, it's starting to get better, but it would have been about a year ago, and people say it's like, you know, if only, if only Solus had ARM, if only it did, then it would be an overnight success. To which I said, which ARM? And you can imagine, like, their expression on the other end of it. Be like, what do you mean? Is it like, <laughs> is it ARM 5? Is it ARM 6? Is it ARM 7? Is it soft ABI? Is it hard flow? And they're just like, what are you on about? <laughs> so you would need to support three or four different ARM versions just out of the box, which is effectively three or four different architectures. And then you've got to keep up the latest one. But if you say that 21 now, it's like, well, there's only ARM 7. Yeah. Until the next ARM. Yeah. But are, are they that different, though? Are they as different as x86 and ARM? Yeah. Really? They're that different? Yeah. You, well, they're, they're going to share some things, right? But not as much as, say, um, x86 and x86-64. You know, there's not that much in common. So it's, like, it's almost like a complete different architecture each time. So you have to have a tool chain, you have to have a repulse for that kind of ARM. It's, it's a whole architecture. All right, so it may as well be ARM and MIPS then, two different versions of ARM. Basically, yeah. Um, 
and supporting an architecture isn't overly difficult when you look at it on paper, but then it's like you need to be able to build those packages too. You know, you need to be able to continuously deploy those. You need images, you need testing, you need the infrastructure, you need the repositories for them, you need the continuous integration processes. And for me, the market that I basically see for ARM, the only one that I would allow, say, for a desktop system is going to be ARM 7, and that's going to be for the Chromebook. But what happens when the next version of ARM comes along? Yeah. So, yeah, just not for me, not for me. It's it's too niche. And as much as, yeah, it is sad to see a distro go, when you're supporting a niche of a niche, <laughs> it it's, it's kind of bound to happen. Well, yeah, if you've got tens of users, then mm. trying to justify all that development and infrastructure is just very difficult, isn't it? And that's mm. the bottom line is they're not going to do it anymore. So, oh, well, there we go. Gen 2 for ARM, problem solved. Yeah. 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 So um, mixed news, I suppose you would say with this one, Mozilla acquires Pocket. So there was a bit of controversy, wasn't there? Um, I think it was last year when Mozilla started bundling Pocket, a proprietary service, into Firefox, a free software open source browser. And now they've finally decided to buy them and bring them under the Mozilla umbrella. Now, for me, this is excellent news because I use Pocket on a daily basis. Now, I'm guessing that you two don't, failing because you don't like freedom-hating stuff and Ike because you never leave your computer. <laughs> I don't know what it is. So it's read it later is the thing. Uh, that's the, their kind of tagline. So you can add your news stories or whatever links to Pocket, and then you can read them later um, offline on your phone, for example. So right. what Jesse has always done when he's been podcasting is uh, saved all of the links that we're going to be talking about to Pocket, and then he can open them up on his phone on the tube where he's got no uh, Wi-Fi, uh, no signal at all, and he can read them. And it also makes it um, a really easily readable format. It strips out all of the bullshit CSS, all of the images that you don't need, and just makes it really, really easy to read your news stories or whatever it is that you want to read. So it's like bookmarks on acid. Yeah, and pretty much. Better than file, save, web page complete. Yeah. It's kind of like halfway in between, I suppose. Huh. I kind of want it now. Yeah, it's fucking brilliant. I use it basically <laughs> peering behind the curtain of how this show comes together is every day I read a load of RSS feeds and anything that looks vaguely interesting to me, I add to my pocket. And then I keep reading my massive list. I don't generally read the whole story. I read a bit of it. Oh, okay, that's, you know, uh, Raspberry Pi Zero has come out, uh, Zero W, add that to pocket. And then, uh, then at various intervals usually every day or so i go through pocket and actually read the stories that i've put in there so it's yeah i think that your analogy there ike is brilliant that it is a, like a cross between bookmarking it and save page as html complete or whatever um only it makes it really easy to read and i can read it if i've got no signal on the tube or whatever so um so that's what pocket is i can't believe you two didn't really know what it was but uh <laughs> hey, don't rope me in. I knew exactly what it was. I killed it in about config about a year ago when it was oh, okay. proprietary because <laughs> I Fair didn't enough. even want to just accidentally use it. So Yeah. All right. So so now um, they say it's going to be brought under the um, open source um, bit of Mozilla. So we're hoping, or at least I'm hoping, they're going to open source the, the client side and the server side. That would be amazing. You'd almost expect they'd have to because you couldn't really take them seriously if they didn't. Well, yeah. I mean, if Mozilla if Mozilla's going to use proprietary software and then you know sort of propagate it, I mean, you know, I think they should just go home. Yeah. Well, yeah, I totally agree. Um, so w what I don't like about Pocket is they've added social integration and adverts and oh, stuff God. that are just I I just don't need that bullshit. So if they do properly open source it, and I can run the server instance on my own DigitalOcean droplet or even on a local box, maybe even a Raspberry Pi. And then there's a properly open source app that I can install on my phone through F droid. Then it's a winner. As far as I'm concerned, then I'm totally in control. No one knows what I'm reading. That data is not being sold to some company somewhere. And it means that I can have a really useful service that I'm fully in control of. Yeah. Well, you see, if I was Mozilla and I was losing my revenue share, 
all of a sudden I now have a way to potentially mine your data to be lucrative to somebody else then oh yeah because it's going to be easier it's going to be far easier to just install pocket open source or not and the vast yeah. majority of people who are using it and I, th- I think it was like 10 million users a day they've got at the moment jesus okay it's so it's a popular thing that's a lot of pockets yeah exactly and most <laughs> of those pockets are still going to be uh sharing their data with mozilla which they can then monetize somehow but to be honest i don't give a shit about that as long as i can take the code and run it somewhere else and cut them out of it, which they're going to have to do if it's open source. Fully open source, that is. Yeah. I mean, one way they can do it is they could still have the proprietary backend, but an open source protocol and client. But I couldn't really see them getting away with that. Well, uh, they could get away with it, but their reputation would be damaged even further. I mean, the the whole pocket thing was pretty damaging to them in our community, wasn't it? Hmm. I mean, Phelim, you were seriously unimpressed by the sounds of things. Oh, yeah, no, I was, I mean, especially the way it just showed up one day. Um, Yeah, I mean, okay, fair enough. People want to use stuff like that. That's okay. But I don't think Mozilla, as the supposed champions of an open web, should be doing things like that. I mean, I'm sure back a year ago, their whole plan was to do exactly this. And they couldn't, due to legal reasons, make it public. But, you know doing it the way they did they have to look at the other side of these things they have to have the appearance of being open as well well you know what's funny is that um paddy and jesse had gone on about it how amazing pocket was or not amazing but how they how useful it was how they used it all the time and i, I never bothered and then they <laughs> Mozilla forced it into firefox so i um, may as well check it out then i suppose and then i've been hooked ever since <laughs> so it literally worked on me yeah i have a confession oh yeah I don't use Firefox, and I haven't used Firefox in about two years for myself. Yeah, because you're a pragmatic man, aren't you? You don't really care about freedom. You... It's an appalling browser. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's And it's, it saddens me, because it was supposed to be our browser, almost. I mean, it was never for us originally, but you know, when it came to Linux, and it was ported over, and it became good. We had something to be proud of, and they were going to defend an open web and open standards for us. And then you get to where we are now, where Firefox is basically trying to play catch up with Google Chrome, who in some places are already light years ahead of them, i.e. a multi-process architecture that works. And they're having to compromise on their principles on a daily basis. And I mean, a perfect example of that is they're trying to get to a point now where they can support the encrypted media extensions to play Netflix. There was a time they never, ever would have dreamed of that. And has pragmatism won for them over their own values? Well, I read something that um, by some metric, the the Firefox market share had dropped to, I can't remember exactly, 5 or 6% or something. And Chrome was well, well over 50 And... So they've got to do something, haven't they? If if you can't do what you want to do in the browser, you're not going to use it unless you are like you, Phelan, and value freedom and open source and all the rest of that over pragmatism. And get fuck all done. <laughs> Wait a second. Before you start sticking the boot in too much, I somewhat am pragmatic. I don't completely just go <laughs> full storm on that, for Christ's sake. Yeah, but what browser do you use day to day? Firefox. Right. And do you have Chrome installed for the things you need Chrome for? I don't. I, I, I don't want it. I, I have Chromium for tests, but I just I just don't like it, to be honest. I don't see what the value is. Um, I've never seen it be dramatically quicker. Um, all my bookmarks are stored on Mozilla, so I'm, I'm, it's not like I'm going to go syncing stuff up in some other machine. I don't even know how you'd do that with Chromium, to be quite honest. Oh, you can sign into Google and use all the proprietary Fuck goods. Fuck off, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go out and self No, 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 no. It's not going to happen. Uh, there's no way. I, look, the, the reason I don't use Google was actually pragmatic because even though it didn't affect me, uh, I knew a few people. Um, they used Google Reader for a lot of stuff and Google killed it. And I just looked at that and I said, it's only a matter of time before something I'm using, they're going to kill it, and I'm going to be dependent on it. It's not like 
you know, you have to use Google Reader. But when they killed it, the amount of people who were going on about, oh, quick use this amazing service. Oh, it's shit. Quick use this one. Oh, that's, we've essentially DDoSed it. Fuck, what do we do? And you'd swear that, like, the world was caving in because people couldn't read the RSS feed. But it kind of was because it's something that you do. You don't want to have to deal with this crap. So you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're dependent on that type of stuff. And that's where I come from. And that's why Firefox, I, a very stripped down version. I don't use many of the features bar the bookmark syncing. And, you know, I'm not going to start using things like Pocket, even though it's open, unless they're going to allow you to install it yourself. I just, I'm not going to go with it. I'd rather use a combination of own cloud and KD Connect. But what about if it does get fully open sourced and you can you run your own instance of the server and client? Well, that's great. I mean, that's perfect. That's what you want. Because then if... You know, they suddenly decide in three months' time that, oh, she's no, we don't like this anymore. We're killing the servers. You're not left trying to, you know, find a new workflow because there's enough things to be doing in the world without having to go around relearning how to use the things that you've become used to and kind of become dependent on day in, day out. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. It's a good point. So, uh, Ike, you mentioned it there. You almost segued perfectly, but then uh, we uh, fucked that up uh, <laughs> into um, encrypted media extensions. And the WC3 are going to implement this encrypted media extensions into web standards, which means that it's going to give green light for all the browser makers to chuck it in and basically enable DRM. And it's it's their kind of blessing for DRM. At least that's the way the FSF sees it. Because if you look at defectivebydesign.org, they talk about digital restrictions management which is uh, yeah, really helpful, guys. Yeah, nice one. And they just rip apart this whole idea of introducing encrypted media extensions into the web standards. Which I don't know. I've read Tim Berners Lee's take on it, uh, typos and all, and poor grammar <laughs> and all the rest of it. And I've read the perfectly written uh, Free Software Foundation's post on it. And I, I I was reading it again today, trying to think, where do I stand on this? And I, I hate to be a fence-sitting bastard, but I really don't know. Because on the one hand, DRM is bad. But on the other hand, DRM is not going away. But then on the other hand, if the web standards said, fuck you to DRM, then maybe it might have a chance of going away. But then people will just find a way to make DRM work with plugins or something. So I'm just so conflicted on it. Yeah, I mean... For DRM to go, we would need to get rid of the idea of ownership of media, of copyright, which kind of flies in the face as well of even copyleft, because then there's no owner. Oh, yeah. I mean, copyleft is just a, a total reinforcement of the copyright system. Yeah, if anything, in some places, is actually worse. It's not to say I don't support it, but, in, you know, it's we very much are the owner, and this is what you can do with it. Well, that's kind of the same as what you're doing with DRM as well. So you have a content owner and you have restrictions of what you can do with it. So if we agree that there is no way that we can have a world at the moment where nobody owns the media, somebody has to own that media, do people seriously expect me to believe that we're just going to turn off DRM and say, oh no, it's okay, we promise we will not pirate this. Bollocks. Complete and utter bollocks. What did people do when they had VCRs? They stuck to scarlet between them and they copied the tapes off. Yeah, but <laughs> to, to be fair, if you make it so that it's affordable for every person, say it was, I don't know, for argument's sake, $10, 10 euros, 10 quid, doesn't matter, mm. per month to access all of the content in the world, music, TV, books, uh, movies, all the rest of it. So like a good version of Netflix, essentially. Yeah, yeah. DRM free. <laughs> Uh, no proprietary bollocks. You can just download it from the website, all open standards, all the rest of it. Piracy would all but disappear. Obviously, there's some cheap bastards that say, I'm not paying $10 a, a month. I can get it completely for free off Pirate Bay or whatever. But I can't help but feel that if it was more affordable and if it was less of a piss take, because at the moment, right, you've got um, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu Plus, all these different siloed, services and if you want access to everything you have to pay for all of those separate things spotify and you know some stuff's only on itunes and all the rest of it and so it ends up being a very expensive endeavor to consume all of the media that you want to consume unless you just rob it off pirate bay 
Uh, where, yeah. Whereas if they all got together, and they would probably solve piracy overnight by making it, you know, even if it was twenty dollars, pounds, euros, whatever per month, people would probably pay that. I don't think it's really so much a problem with DRM itself. I mean, I, I wouldn't re really agree that it's a necessary evil because it's the justification for it being a necessary evil is well, it's a necessary evil, so it's necessary. Not really. That's kind of a cop out argument. Because like you say, like, well, if you have universal access to a thing, then it's no longer a problem. I mean, to draw a parallel, it's the same kind of thing with weed in the United States. It's no longer a legal issue, then it's no longer a rampant problem because it's not so much of a black market thing anymore. I think it's more of a problem with the licensing, how the, the various agencies and entities are licensed these movies and these rights in different areas in the world. So if you can compare the Netflix that we have here, even between Ireland and the UK, but then compare that to what you have over in the US, is completely different content. Yeah. Because there's a different set of laws. There's a different set of licenses in each place in the world. So it's like these companies are double booking themselves. So you have exclusive rights there, but only you have exclusive rights there. It's It seems like the entire industry there is set up to screw everyone including those in it and those consuming it and there's a problem because there's a test case where drm was got rid of and people made a lot a lot of money and that's itunes well, that's true actually yeah when that started it was um just drm to the max and then yeah. they made it i think it was 79p a song with drm or 99p without and now there's no drm because so many people were willing to pay an extra little bit for no drm it's that kind of thing as well. Like there, there's always that niggling thing in the back of your mind. Like you don't fully own something. But yeah, you you buy a license to it, don't you? Yeah, it's like, it, and it seems to apply to everything now because there's always this limited warranty or this limited ownership. Like a, a kind of similar case, funny enough, was when I bought my phone. I said, you know, like because um, I got insurance for a year on it just in case anything happens. Where it's like, you know, if I put any my own software on this, I said, no, no, you can't do that. So my question was, well, who owns the phone then? If I if I just bought this from you and you're telling me I can't put these things on there, who owns it? So I think people would like to truly own the content they download and stop getting rogered in that sense, like paying seventy pounds for a game. <laughs> yeah. Well, can we drag it back to um, the the what started this discussion then, and that is whether or not. DRM, the encrypted media extension, should be brought into the web standards or not? I mean, wh where do you stand on that? I don't think they should be in there, but I can see that they have to be in there uh, for exactly <laughs> what you say. I use Netflix because I would like to watch some stuff and I would like to do it legally because I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, well, if it's not open, I'm going to pirate it. No, and I'm not just saying that because I, I think the RIAA are now sending an attack helicopter to my house. But no, I, I think, you know, you have to be able to show people that they can use our software for looking at stuff. And you're not going to be able to do that. You can't just say, not all those things that you like, you can't have them anymore. You can listen to MP3s now. Hey, that's great. But you, you've got to be able to give people access to stuff that they need. It was definitely a place, though, for Berners-Lee and the like to actually stand up to this a bit more and make a decent case for it. They, they sort of rolled over. So what would you have done? Would you have, you, you've kind of sitting on the fence like I am there by the sounds of things. I was hoping you wouldn't draw attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> if you were Tim Berners-Lee, what would you do? What would you have done in this case? I don't know. I think I'd probably have to make a more argued opinion, like a, you know, really state the fact that how wrong it was and then say, but I will. But I'm yeah. doing it anyway. Yeah, essentially. I mean, it, I mean, you can't redo much. He, he's not going to fight them. It's not going to work. They're too, they're too entrenched at the moment. I think you have to kind of almost do the way, dare I say it, Jobs did a good job. Hey, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, take that clip, <laughs> listeners. Yeah, totally intentional. Uh, you know, he he did say, oh yeah, okay. If you want music, you've you're going to have DRM. It's going to be brilliant, and then sort of bait and switch them afterwards and then said ha ha no dear m or you know we're in the strong position now the only problem is i don't think they're going to be in that strong position ever so yeah we'll see and what about you Ike? what would you have done i mean there comes a point when somebody has to make a stand against it but looking at how the world currently works you know he's not in charge 
And he doesn't really have that much. He's, he's a figurehead. Yeah, but he's point. an influential figurehead. No, he's a figurehead. So you're saying he's got no influence? He's pissing Not really, no. I mean, yes, he's an important person, right? But is he really going to tell Hollywood, no, fuck you, you're not having it? No, because if he does that, then there is going to be a lot of negative force against him because he would be stopping the progression of web technology. And that's how it would be painted because he would be the one that would be blocking things. Well, these, this is why we can't have nice things because he had to go all up about it and he wanted it all to be free. And that's how people would go. So either way... He's going to be somebody's public enemy, number one, on either side of the camp. And if you're going to be anyone's enemy, are you going to be an enemy of the people or are you going to be an enemy of Hollywood? And that's kind of the choice, isn't it? You still haven't answered the question, what would you have done? I'm a stubborn bastard, so I would have said something. So, <laughs> what, you would not have allowed encrypted media extensions into the web standards? I would have looked for a better alternative. Okay, so that's one one all. I'm afraid I'm going to side with Phelim. I think ultimately I would have probably fallen down on the side of uh, Berners-Lee on this one. I would have had to have done it because the bottom line is DRM is not going away. And at least if in the standards we can have some control over how it's done, it's better than fucking Silverlight and Flash and all that bollocks. It's going to be just as bad though. You just know it. Probably. probably. At least we've got a chance with this. So. Um, all right, anyway, let's move on. Um, a bit of admin. Um, if you want to get in contact, uh, show at latenightlinux.com is the email address. Or if you go to latenightlinux.com slash contact, you can find various other ways, Twitter and Google Plus and even Facebook. Not that we look at that ever. Um, and our Telegram group as well, latenightlinux.com slash Telegram, if you want to have a chat with us, especially Ike late at night. He tends to ramble on quite a lot and... Uh, talk about stuff and i when i've got time i'm in there but i'm kind of in and out and fail him and jesse not so much and it's much better than the ubuntu podcast one i just like to point out and you should if you remember that leave it yeah leave leave that one and uh, yeah. shrink shrink their numbers immediately you do realize they're about to start again and they're just going to absolutely cream us yeah well, we might get a week <laughs> in at least yeah well we'll see uh, right, a couple of events then, speaking of Ubuntu podcast, uh, Foss Talk Live 2017, which I now have to look up when the date is because I'm too useless, uh, the 24th of June 2017 at the Harrison in King's Cross or near King's Cross in London, UK, the earth. Um, it's going to be a free evening of live Linux podcasts and it's going to be us, uh, or at least me, Phelim and Jesse, but you are refusing to come over for this, Ike. Yep. Tweet him, hassle him on the Telegram group, make him come. You got a few months. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> uh, what? Uh, make him come to the event, <laughs> and also wank him off while you're there. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be ours and the Ubuntu podcast, and also Stuart Language of um, Bad Voltage Fame is going to be there with Dave Mega Slippers of Geek News Radio Fame. And they are going to do a show at the end. I was with them last time, but it went horribly wrong because I was too drunk. But we'll have to see what happens. Um, last year, we had Linux Voice. This year, I would like to have Linux Voice, but I would also like them to reply to my emails and things, <laughs> which they don't tend to do very well. I've been speaking to Graham a bit, and he says, well, they're kind of up for it in principle. It's like, I want to advertise this thing, man. Tell me if you're coming or not. So there are no tickets available yet. It's going to be free. But I do ask people to register tickets so we know who's coming and blah, blah, blah. But keep the date. Anyway, 24th of June, 2017. It's going to be a great night. Um, last time, I think it was between 6 and 11 p.m. Um, and just live podcasts and a chance to meet up with people. It should be good fun. Um, and also, what, what, what? Our camp in the same year. It didn't happen last year, but it is officially happening this year. I've been following this on the mailing list and not saying much because uh, I'm too busy to help much. But it is going to be the 19th and 20th of August over the weekend there, Saturday and Sunday, in Canterbury. And I think I'm going to go. I need to sort out how I'm going to park there because I can't be bothered to get the train when it's relatively easy to drive. But anyway, it should be good. There aren't that many details yet, but it's um, in Canterbury, the 19th and 20th of August. Phelan, are you coming over for this as well? I hope so. Okay, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, this is the first time I've heard dates, so yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's as three. if you never read the show doc and click the links in it. Well, if I'm looking at it right now, I don't see any date on there. <laughs> yeah, Odd Camp 17 is on. Yeah. After much wrangling over the past year, we're very happy to announce that Odd Camp 17 will be happening on the 19th and 20th of August 2017. Jeez, what doc are you looking at? What, what, what yeah, doc I'm am I looking at? The looking same at? doc as it's, it's not there. <laughs> well, if you click the link in the document. Oh, for God's oh. sake. God. So that's what, what the they have links in computers well. now. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. links. Tim invented these. If you uh, click on them, <laughs> uh, do not have direct media extension installed. What? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Og Camp should be good. It's a much bigger event than Fast Talk Live, but it's um, more more of a commitment. It's more of people will be flying in from that. I don't know. You're obviously a bit of a mug fan, and for flying in all the way for like yeah. five, six hours, five hours in a pub, I have but, to meet uh, the people, you know. Yeah, you have to meet the the great unwashed listeners. That's it. But um, yeah, anyway, both events should be cool, and I will almost definitely be at both of them, and so will Phelim and Jesse as well. I'll probably have to drive Jesse down again. Um, last time there was an old camp, which was in 2015. I did the panel, and that was a bit of a disaster. So I'll probably try and make Stuart do it this time and maybe be on it. We'll have to see. You wanted me to come that time as well, um, 2015, and I was still living over in England at the time. I even said no, man. <laughs> For God's <laughs> sake, man. You're such a lazy bastard. You just want to sit well, in I that mean... flat and stuff your face with Pringles, don't you? Oh, I don't know I want Pringles. But I mean, more important than all of that, right? The the mo- What we're really missing out on here is, do you have the contact details? for the web developer for Ogcamp? Uh, the site is, it, that's last time site and it is being worked on apparently. When was the last one? 2015. You sure? What, you're saying that it's a shit <laughs> theme that they've got for WordPress? I am not saying anything like that. I am just saying it may have slightly passed its expiration date. Well, <clears> well a couple of decades. feel free to design a new website for them. I'm sure there'll be gloriously happy with that oh that's not the deal <laughs> or like make josh do it or something i don't know whatever yeah yeah but i'm sure honestly they would they they are actually looking for someone to sort the website out for them oh that's awkward <laughs> <laughs> yeah so now you've committed to it on air <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> yes because uh, it like they've just sort of chucked it up with the dates for now and um the accommodation details and stuff like that but um yeah, it's it's much like the Foss Talk site, which is fosstalk.com. Um it's a work in progress. Um and you've got to kind of get the date in the diary before you sort the details out, if you know what I mean. Um but anyway, so time ticks on, so we better get on with it. Um something that I've been meaning to talk to you guys about for a while now is Cody. Formerly XBMC, which once a very long time ago stood for Xbox Media Center. It's a pretty cool media center with an interface that is suited to a tv rather than the computer but you can run it on anything from a giant tv down to even a phone which i sometimes run it on and it's all free open source software and so it should be totally uncontroversial however there's been a growing trend at least in the uk and i assume in other parts of the world for people to essentially make or buy Android devices, install Kodi on it, and then install a load of third-party plugins for it, which is, uh, which because it's open source and, you know, it's it's very easy to do that. All you need is a zip file with some files in it. And these hooky plugins connect to all sorts of essentially illegal streams of movies, TV, and all the rest of it. And so it is now, over the last, I suppose, six months or so, been in and out of the media and Cody itself, the name has become synonymous with piracy. And so the, the question that I have for you is what the hell did Cody do about the PR problem? They're just a free open source software project that officially don't condone piracy. Um, and yet their name has been dragged through the mud because a few people wanted to sell Android boxes with hooky plugins on it. I mean, Ike, what would you do if people were selling Solus <laughs> on a box and putting a load of plugins? I mean, there's there's nothing stopping you downloading Solus, installing it, and and put putting a load of bookmarks to loads of torrent sites, for example. Hmm, can do that, and it wouldn't be my fault, basically, because I mean, the, the problem here is like 
Cody is accessing illegal content. No, Sky Movies have shit security. <laughs> Fix your security. Oh, things are getting stolen from us. Close your doors. Well, to, <laughs> to be fair, I think a lot of these streams are people just capturing it and then rebroadcasting it. I don't think it's like literally tapping into the servers hmm. on Sky or whatever. I mean, what can you do? Like, all you can do is kind of maintain the public stance, which they've trying to do for a while now. It's like raise themselves above piracy but i mean that's kind of all they can do here they'll make it clear that we don't condone it but there's nothing else they can do they can't attack people for it they can't take action over it um well to be fair actually these people have been arrested they probably could actually have a suit against them yeah i suppose they could do that because the the police and the authorities are not particularly interested in the people buying the boxes and watching Sky Sports for free in their living rooms. They're, they're interested in the people making hundreds of grand selling these boxes. And as you say, there have been some arrests, some high-profile arrests recently. And so you think that Cody ought to do a civil case against them to kind of show that they're really anti it. I mean, I think they could because, in a sense, it's defamation, isn't it? I suppose, yeah. I mean, that's one thing that could be argued of it. And then, you know, it, it's impacting the, the business of Cody because as much as they are open source, they're also very, very big and involved with big groups as well. You know, they've got a bit of a muscle. They've got a bit of clout. If they've really wanted to make it clear to the industry, like, you know, we don't tolerate this, then, yeah, I think they'd have to take some action. What the kickback would then be from the community, I don't know. But how long, right? Every time I uh, hear this or or read this being discussed, everyone seems to ignore the fucking elephant in the room here. And that is that Cody is free software open source, right? That allows you to play your own media. That's that's all they do. But what fucking use is it if you haven't pirated a load of shit to play on it? <laughs> well, you buy the box set from Amazon and you stick it on your file server and you share it over Samba. Right. Yeah, 2% of people using it do that. I'd like to state on record, that's me. <laughs> right, and all, all I use Cody for, really, is for live streaming um, iPlayer because it's better than the iPlayer website. It, you get it 720p and actually glitch-free and all the rest of it. I don't know what Cody are doing with drivers or whatever, but I don't get screen tearing or whatever. So that's all I've ever really used it for. But come on, the majority of people using Cody are pirating shit to play on it. Let's not forget that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of what it's for. It's like, why do you have a collection of 100,000 MP3s? Why have you got 20,000 movies on there? What, you, you took 20,000? And then they're going to be like 1080p as well. So, you know, you've just taken 20,000 Blu-rays, have you? And just put them onto your local media server. I think not. Yeah, exactly. People with terabytes yeah. full of stuff. Oh, yeah, I ripped that all. Yeah, yeah. Now, I do know yeah, people. It took me a year. Well, I, I know a fella... Um, who I used to do the Mind Tech podcast with many, many years ago in LA. And he literally does that. He's got a Mac Mini that most of the time is ripping Blu-rays because he likes to collect them as well. And he's, he can't be really be bothered with pirating and stuff. But I can't help but feel that he is in the minority here and that most of the people using Cody are doing it for illegal shit anyway. And so these other people who are buying Cody boxes. And, and that's the thing, right? So traditionally, Cody was used by nerds geeks linux users the kind of people who listen to this show right um techie people but now i'm meeting normal people who have heard of cody because they're buying these hooky boxes either off ebay or gumtree or down the market or whatever and so normal people are being exposed to open source software albeit for the wrong reasons if you believe in the copyright system but isn't that like sort of a win in a way that like normal people are using open source software? It is. And the, the knock on effect as well is those actually providing the media in a legitimate way, i.e. the copyright owners now have to compete with this new black market. They got to remain competitive because these boxes aren't going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. So the, the knock on effect might be a lowering in bills for services like Netflix and sky movies because they'll have to compete. Well, I mean, that goes back to what I was saying um, when we're talking about the encrypted media extensions, that if there was a way to use free and open source software like Cody or VLC or whatever to access legitimate DRM-free media from all of the studios, all of the 
TV um, production companies, blah, 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 music and everything for a fixed fee, most people would do that. And I suppose that the more people using these supposedly pirate streams and Cody boxes, maybe, possibly, that might force the old industry into a new way of doing things. And, and yeah, Netflix is doing quite well. Ish. Ish. To the point where you have competitors like Amazon, Prime, Video, and you know even CBS. I think there is the new Star Trek thing new Star Trek series going to be on CBS, their um, streaming platform. Everyone wants to have their own version of it rather than coming together. I mean, it's ironically, I suppose it's quite like open source, isn't it? It's like, Mm. you know, instead of all coming together and making one amazing distro, fuckers like you, Ike, just make your own. (laughs) Mine's better. (laughs) (laughs) Well, exactly. And Amazon probably think theirs is better than Netflix. What if... Now, if Sky, or in my case, it'd be Aircom. Sorry, no, it's not Aircom now. Uh, they spent $7 billion uh, uh, euros uh, uh, renaming themselves to Air. <laughs> you mean R? No, Air. Okay. <laughs> they dropped three letters. Yeah, R. You people with your uh, funky fucking... No, it's E-I-R. Oh, okay, Aira. No. No, <laughs> that's with an E at the end. Uh, okay, whatever, Air. <laughs> anyway... My Sky that's not Sky, right? <laughs> you know, if they was to say, like, here's a Cody box, and it was literally called a Cody box. Actually, they might want to think about the brand in there now with the connotations. Anyway, if you had one of those and they said, you know, it cost you a 10 hour a month to run it, and you can watch all these films on it, I'd get one. Yeah, and access whatever music you wanted. I mean, I know you do that yeah. through YouTube anyway, so you're not bothered. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you could have all the movies and TV shows and everything uh, for a tenner, even if it was 25, even if it was 30 a month, most people yeah. would do it. Oh, well, maybe this is where Tim Berners-Lee is actually coming in with a secret plan where his <laughs> encrypted media extensions and the Cody box, and he's got himself a new business plan there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But that would be kind of cool because... It'd be one of the first times the providers wouldn't say to you, you know, like, you explicitly need, like, a, a, a dedicated phone line and the broadband for this and a bundle deal. You know, you could just be, like, an existing broadband customer and say, you know, like, for 15, 20, whatever a month, you know, whack this box and it plugs into your telly and it runs off your internet and you got all this content on there. You know, one, they no longer have to make all their own software for these boxes as well, by the way. You know, because they're all running some moody version yeah. of Busy Box from six years ago. So that would solve that problem overnight. Uh, we'd all have this standardized UI we're all comfortable with. And we would have access to legitimate content, which was actually decent. Because the bigger networks have the access to it. Whereas Netflix would come back and say, we've newly added this show. What was it? Hitler's Life Story, 1970. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> you know? And that's like Netflix in a box, like... Can I can I bring up another aspect of this, right? And that is that supposing you don't really know much about open source and you read in the media these constant stories about Kodi boxes, and every time you read it, they mention Kodi open source software. And then you have people being arrested, open source software. It just kind of sticks in your brain that open source software is bad. So it could it be that this is like quite bad for open source software generally that people associate it with moody cody boxes nah it'll have the opposite effects because in in the sort of climate we're in at the moment people kind of see it as you know giving one to the man almost it's like ah you know they're winning against them so i don't think it's a negative thing people say it like it's looking for ways around the system as far as they're concerned not that i'm condoning piracy <laughs> it just makes it very clear now you know i have no view one way or the other we just need lars ulrich to make a statement about how he hates cody <laughs> and we're sorted total napster reversal there yeah well i mean what i've always said um about piracy and and stuff is, is something that fab from linux outlaws once said to me and he said that if you want people to respect open source licenses such as the GPL, then you have to respect these horrible proprietary licenses as well. And if you go pirating content and be it software or whatever, um, or, or media, then how can you expect them to not do GPL violations and stuff? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's kind of annoyed me for a long while is now, again, I'm not 
sitting on either side of this and the whole piracy thing. But one of the things you definitely see within the open source community is the people who supposedly do respect the, the freedom and the spirit and blah, blah, blah of open source and free software. And then in the next minute, it's like, uh, you know, I've, I've got this pirate version of blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, you can just download these programs. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so uh, then if that's the case, you're only using open source, not because it's free, but because it's free. Yeah. And at that point, you just look at him. It's like, you're a cheapskate bellend because you get the likes of, and I don't mean to call him out, but Wogu, which is the old world of GNOME uh, blog, up in Google Plus is frequently doing that, you know, showing the stuff that they pirate and download. It's like, no, there's a difference between free and free. I'm still willing to pay for something regardless, you know, whether it's open or closed source. Like, I'm still happy to do that. Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at gaming, um, whenever they do the, the humble bundles, I mean, or at least when they used to, you'd see that the Linux users would pay much more than the Windows and Mac users. So yeah. it seems that Linux people are willing to pay for stuff. And I think, though, the problem is I'd have no problem paying for things, but you're almost always never given the opportunity. Um, you know, you can't, for instance, like recently Ireland played uh, in Chicago against uh, the All Blacks. Now, that was on one sports channel over here, which I would say roughly 50% of people who have TVs have access to because it was not, a, you know, it was like one of these things where one Virgin Media has one set and Air has the other, and it was like non-interchangeable. Uh, so you, like, you couldn't watch it even if you paid money. It was just, you had to, the only way to watch it would be to subscribe to TV package from them. So then you would have two TV packages separately. And it's not like just adding a channel like Sky. It's an entire new line into your house. So your only option was to go to the pub then? Yeah, well, if you had a pub that also had that situation. So it, was, it wasn't even plain sailing in that regard. So we need to kind of remove all these obstacles and have a... If, we, if there's a free market as such, you know, if I want to watch, you know, the latest TV show that comes out in the States and it's out on a Friday night, fair enough, it's out at two o'clock in the morning our time. I should be able to watch that if I want to, and I should be able to pay a fair price for it. Not wait either a week, a day, or six months till, you know, maybe my local channel has it if I'm lucky, or Sky Atlantic or something like that. You know, it, provide a, a fair open access market and then let that decide. But they're not doing that. Well, as much as I hate Spotify, they've basically killed music piracy. So, you know, that because that's generally all well i suppose you've got apple music as well but most stuff is on spotify and most people i know subscribe to it at least for free if not you know either they subscribe for free and pay uh, pay by listening to adverts or they pay for it and have no adverts but spotify certainly among sort of professional types in london is massively successful and music piracy has gone down as, as a result of that as far as i understand it and it just seems that the, the video side of things, they need to sort out. Yeah, I think it's just videos trailing audio. And I think eventually maybe we'll get there where they give up on their own sort of protocols, their own setup, their own software. And then they just go with a standard when the standard becomes entrenched enough. And maybe that's what encrypted media uh, extensions is. Who knows? Well, here's hoping. Uh, right. Well, time gets the better of us, so we'd better wrap this up. We'll be back in a couple of weeks then when hopefully Jesse will be back from his skiing trip, hopefully with no broken legs, uh, helicoptered back. We better not say that. It's tempting fate, isn't it? Oh, well. You've done it now. <laughs> right. And so let me just say, no bloody Irish sign-offs. Be sensible about this. Right. So, uh, yeah, I've been Joe. I've been Phelan. I'm still Ike. On Will Cadigum Dulgadi and Leveris. Ha! You fucking Irish twats. <laughs> No, no, really, can I? <laughs>